Keys consults your physician prior to making any major changes in your diet and in your physical exercise routines. Uh, this session is not intended to exactly discuss diet trends. Um, and also this session will include biblical references. So I wanted to throw that out there, it, it, you know, just in case you, just in case. <laughs> so uh, as, a, as uh, being prudent, I wanted to uh, give those disclaimers. So, uh, you know, I want to begin my talk with what my personal health and wellness philosophy is. And I think this is important because it gives you an idea of how I've married both my academic posture with um, both my personal training as well as my faith. Uh, so my philosophy is to take a non-invasive approach, as was just mentioned, uh, for my clients to prevent uh, and or reduce risk of cardiometabolic disruption. And you can see what my academic focus is here, as well as my focus as a personal trainer. Uh, I want to further provide empowerment and not to belabor the point, but um, or repeat the intro. But I do like to empower clients' health and fitness literacy uh, and this ability, again, to read and comprehend and use information so that you can vet it against your own information when you're making decisions that promote your own health uh, and wellness. Then I like to uh, use this little equation at the bottom, which includes uh, only having a proper knowledge of clinical definition of uh, what is normal or higher versus higher weights uh, that are associated with cardiovascular risk, coupled with the things that you see here, mindful weight management, mindful eating, regular exercise, monitoring your blood pressure and blood sugar. Uh, can we actually continue to progress towards reducing cardiovascular risk. So, uh, you know, I want to sort of give a precursor uh, as to what this talk is about. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.31 tells us that whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Uh, and so that kind of encapsulates uh, sort of my marriage of faith and fitness and what I hope to, you know, convince you of by the end of this talk. So first off, a little bit about a little bit more about me, actually, I have a passion for health and wellness. I'm a certified trainer with American Council on Exercise. I'm a certified, as I mentioned before, fitness nutrition specialist. Uh, there's not yet a national body or certification body that recognizes faith and fitness uh, uh, trainers or coaches. But when it comes out, I'll be sure to get that as well. Uh, all of these images represent places that I've trained in the past. Uh, I also, in addition to my A certification, I'm certified to teach group power with MOSA Let's Move, and then also with bar intensity, uh, which I've done uh, as early or as late as uh, early this year. I have a passion for, uh, um, I don't know, maybe torturing myself. I'm a two-time National Physique Committee member. I'm sorry, National Physique uh, competitor. And so, uh, you know, that's a whole nother story and those are uh, definitely fun and, but also it was torture, <laughs> but it was torture in a good way. <laughs> um, I love community education. I just, I, it makes me smile. As a researcher in epidemiology, I recognize that uh, my work, my academic work and most academic work of, of other researchers can take years to make it to public policy uh, and then trickle down to the individual community members. But as a community health educator and a personal trainer, I get to uh, translate my knowledge almost relatively immediately to clients and the community. So I love being on both sides of that equation. I also have given some examples uh, as well, just like on the title slide of using my social media platform to propagate uh, faith and fitness. And last but not least, uh, I'm a believer. And, uh, and I believe in the power of incorporating God into your faith and fitness walk to either galvanize or to stick with a health and wellness journey and give it more meaning than what it has previously had uh, in your life. So uh, I, I uh, gosh, it's not forwarding. Okay, so I included this slide um, just to show some academic scholarship, my publications, uh, and some pending publications with trauma. Uh, in childhood, which I'll get into a little bit later, and its role in this talk. Uh, I also uh, wanted to highlight um, my 
publications in looking at sleep and cardiometabolic disruption, and then a most recent chapter publication on obesity acceptance, uh, body positivity, and clinical risk factors. So what's the dilemma? Uh, I started out with the title being integrating faith into your fitness journey, but let's back up a little bit and then actually describe the dilemma that we're in in this day and time. Uh, so we live in this culture of an energy imbalance. And uh, what I mean by that is that overweight and obesity are as pervasive as they've ever been in history. Um, and this is not specifically a talk about that, but I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention the sort of very, very sobering position that we're in this day and age. Uh, in the past 20 years, roughly, uh, obesity has increased uh, from about 31% to 42%. What's more troubling or more of concern is that severe obesity has nearly doubled in that same time frame. So going from four, almost 5%, and that's a BMI of greater than 40, uh, and uh, I haven't stratified this by male versus female, but um, I could also stratify by those numbers as well. And they're pretty similar. Um, and what I will bring attention to, as I just kind of alluded to in the book chapter, is uh, this whole movement of uh, fat acceptance with good intention um, and health at every size. Um, I don't have time to go into the granular uh, you know, details of these movements. Um, but they are well-intentioned movements, but uh, they can sometimes uh, not really consider the clinical implications of, of what is being uh, pushed forward or what is being advertised. So we know that uh, it's been established that uh, you know, obesity is steadily on the rise and uh, it's being directly tied to poor health behaviors. Um, but there are other factors. There are other indirect and direct factors, including genetics uh, and how the environment impacts our genetics or what we call epigenetic factors. The gut microbiome has been uh, directly associated with obesity. And I, I'd like to bring a special attention or highlight to traumatic childhood experiences, not only because I have, uh, you know, my prior academic research involves that, but I think it's one of the, the few, or, or one in this list, rather, the only one in this list that has both a spiritual implication as well as a physical uh, or clinical implication. And then uh, we, have to, we have to think about um, being a, a social and environmental de determinants of health inequity uh, researcher, I must mention uh, the upstream factors that go into obesity. And that's Sometimes there's personal biases of healthcare professionals that fail to screen or advise patients based on whatever they may be thinking about the patient. Um, and so we're, we're missing out on those primary, secondary, and tertiary methods of prevention. And then why we're here today is the lack of integration of faith and the role that it plays in uh, health, fitness, and wellness. So there's, uh, you know, what we're all sort of familiar with is uh, the biomedical slash clinical domain of health. Uh, there's five, the pieces move depending on what piece of literature that you're reading. Um, but for this talk, uh, there's gonna, I'm gonna list five domains of health. There's a clinical or, bio, or biomedical domain, but then there's also the social, you know, how do you interact with others? How do you move throughout the world in a social capacity? Um, in terms of the proverbial elbow to elbow with other people that you love or care about, uh, or even your coworkers. Uh, there's the mental domain where, you know, how well do you cope with challenges of life that, uh, that you face? There's functional, which I don't think gets enough attention uh, as, as much as it is coupled with biomedical slash clinical where you are not just looking at the end point, the disease as the end point, but you're also looking at your functionality within that domain. So uh, for example, even going back to some of the movements like health at every size uh, and the fat acceptance movement, um, and those are both the actual terms for those movements. Uh, they're not, those are not my terms. Um, you can be healthy socially. You can be healthy mentally even. Um, but there may be some functional uh, areas that, that may need a little work. Um, so we, we don't want to ignore one entire domain of health 
because we're, we're emphasizing uh, the other domains of health. Uh, and then lastly, uh, there's, there's the spiritual domain of health, which is what, I, what I'm going to really, really do my best uh, effort to convince what could arguably be a half of a day of, of a conference <laughs> into 40 minutes. Um, so the spiritual domain of health. So what is my justification for connecting these two? What's the justification for making this faith and fitness connection? And so what I do is I go to the word. Um, so the first uh, thing that I, I can pretty much lift out is, I don't know, with, in seven scriptures. There's, there's so many, I couldn't, I couldn't even list them all. But um, I just really kind of like uh, chose, selected uh, some that I felt that I could use today. Um, so the first one is Romans 12, 1. Um, and so here, Paul is appealing to us and saying, please, I'm begging you. Um, I appeal to you, please. And brothers can be a, a, a filler for uh, people that he's talking to. Um, by God's mercy, please present your body as a living sacrifice. Keep it holy. Keep it acceptable to God, um, which is your spiritual worship. Um, some have translated that as, which is your uh, reasonable service, or in other words, it's the least that you can do. Uh, and First Corinthians uh, 6, 19 through 20, it says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit uh, that you, you know, whom you have from God, you're not your own, um, glorify God in your body in the best way that you know how. In that same uh, book, we have Paul saying again, uh, don't you know that you're God's temple? And when, he, when he's saying this, it's very important to know that um, at one point uh, he's looking at, he's actually contrasting your body to the temple of Aphrodite at the time. Aphrodite at Corinth, which was the famous temple of Aphrodite. Um, and many of us know uh, some associations with Aphrodite. Um, and so at, by that time, by the time Paul was, was making, was writing 1 Corinthians, it had long fallen. But the cult of Aphrodite and their practices of prostitution were still going on in the city. And so he's, he's pleading to the Corinthians, don't you know that you're, you're not this temple, you're God's temple. Um, and so uh, I can go on and on. Second Peter, uh, for this reason, uh, Peter says, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Um, but it's not just enough to have virtue. You've got to have knowledge with the virtue, which is why we're here today. Um, but also it's not just enough to have knowledge. You've got to also have self-control. Um, and so we can look around at the landscape of, of around us and see how self-control is, is not very pervasive. <laughs> Um, and so not only do you need to have self-control with that discipline, you've got to have steadfastness. You've got to be committed um, with godliness. So you can have godliness, but you need virtue, you need knowledge, self-control, and commitment. Um, and then we've got Hebrews 12 um, that says, for the moment, all discipline is, is, is really rough. <laughs> it's painful um, rather than pleasant, but later it yields a, a lot of good things. Okay, um, and then First Timothy uh, says, you know, don't have anything to do with these irreverent, silly myths. Um, rather, train yourself with godliness while bodily training uh, is of some value, but godliness is of every value. And so this is where we get this idea of marrying these two together. Uh, and then lastly, Isaiah says, but won't they, won't they wait? But they that wait for the Lord, uh, their strength is going to be renewed. Uh, you shall mount up with wings like eagles. And I could have given all types of images of eagles and how strong their wings are, um, just to give you a, 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 a graphic, uh, a visual rather. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. So um, now that we have taken a look at all the five domains and we've got biblical justification for bringing these two ideas together, Let's look at a model that I proposed that may shed some light on the key role of the spiritual domain um, in physical fitness and uh, your health and wellness journey. So in this model, I really wanna emphasize the implications uh, in particular of some traumas that you may have gone through. And like I said, 
I'm emphasizing those because of what I feel that the relationship is between trauma, actually by direct, uh, um, the directional relationship between trauma and spiritual health. Um, and, you know, and studies have established that trauma has adverse later life effects in, um, including, you know, one of my publications. Uh, I've added, thrown a, my little pebble into the, into the literature. And so, um, but we also know that trauma is a spiritual assault, as I mentioned earlier. This model actually draws particular attention to the bi-directional relationship, and I'm getting to fitness, <laughs> uh, trust me on that, um, but the bi-directional relationship between uh, some of the mood disorders like loneliness and depression and anxiety um, and what I call uh, moderators um, between this relationship with uh, your poor you know, poor uh, behaviors. So, so poor sleep, sedentary lifestyles, lack of motivation, and poor eating habits. And I say low self-efficacy here, and this will play a key role in, in, late, in later in the talk, um, because self-efficacy is what we uh, trainers refer to as this ability to believe that you can change, to believe that you can um, change your behavior and that you're capable of accomplishing a goal. And so this is very, I mean, it is like the sweet sauce of personal trainers to identify pretty much in your initial meeting with a client, um, what gauge kind of what their self-efficacy is. Okay, so why is food such a big deal? <laughs> um, is there really a relationship between food and spiritual health, um, between the natural, uh, realm of food and, and eating and the spiritual realm of spiritual health and well-being. <clears throat> and I say emphatically, yes, there is. Um, so food certainly plays a role in both the natural and the spiritual. <clears throat> Excuse me. So God regards food as uh, very sacred in a lot of uh, in a lot of settings in the Bible. Okay. And it's by no happenstance that it takes center stage in many of the settings where we have, um, for example, somewhat regarded as being involved in the first sin. Um, and all of these are figurative, uh, figurative and literal. So um, you can have some figurative interpretation behind certain things as well, but that's a different topic. Um, it was the first of many miracles. It was involved, it was involved in the first setting of the first miracle was at a feast. Okay, so we, we, we can't be lost on that. Um, very strict dietary laws. Uh, the Jews, in the, primarily in the Old Testament, were forbidden to use food in certain ways. Um, and then it was prepared. It was actually commanded to be prepared in certain ways uh, that are still preserved actually to this day. So on the flip side of things, consuming food has a, a direct role in relationship to God and man but also turning your plate down or what we call fasting is also front and center in the Bible. Um, it's an age old biblical practice. Um, today it's called intermittent fasting, which is fine <laughs> um, because you know, the marketplace has recognized the actual benefits uh, both physical and economically of, of, of intermittent fasting. Um, but in a, in a spiritual context, it, it is used so that you can, if you've ever fasted, I've, I've fasted for seven days straight, just water. And it is, it is a challenge to your relationship with the Lord um, because hangry is a real thing. Um, but once you get past that, you're, you're really able to really focus and, um, and really concentrate on what, what God is trying to tell you. Okay. So it's not all doom and gloom. We've been given it for our enjoyment. And we have proof of that. First Timothy says, God's given us food to be received with thanksgiving. Um, so those who, to those who believe and know the truth. And so he, because he loves us, he richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Uh, and that includes food. So there is a, there is light at the end of the tunnel, uh, I'll say. So what are the key roles? And I, and I've kind of whittled this down to the six, like I said, I'm doing my best to kind of condense this, uh, a lot of information and a big key concept in a short amount of time. Um, so what are the six key roles uh, that faith plays in our fitness journey? 
Um, well, faith is worship. Uh, and I know this might be a new concept to some people. Uh, I, as a faith and fitness trainer, I, it's a pillar I stand on. Okay. Uh, faith is, uh, fitness is worship. It is, it is no different than singing, using your voice as an offering or dancing as an offering. Um, fitness is worship and it, and it has different uh, roles in different people's lives because God knows how hard it is for some people more than others. He recognizes that as a sacrifice of praise, because for some people, when you get up in the morning, you're like, uh, uh it's not happening happening today, but I'm going to do it anyway for the, for the glory of God. Um, I dare say that that has uh, more of a weight uh, with God than someone who, who loves to feel the burn. <laughs> and I was one of those people uh, that I love to feel the burn. Um, so fitness is not just a physical activity, but it's also work. I regard it as worship. Um, so it's wise to connect uh, the biblical foundations between the two. What's our evidence? Paul says, um, please, brothers and sisters, and I, and I just quoted this one, if I had to combine or to have one tagline, I would say my whole shtick is Romans 12, 1, which is urging you, please, um, please, with God's mercy, uh, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, be mindful of what you, what you expose your body to, um, what you, the environment that you put it in. Um, make it holy, make it pleasing, make it acceptable to God, which is the, your reasonable service. Uh, and then, I, as I said on the opening tagline, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Faith gives fitness a higher purpose. So if my shtick had to be one verse, it would be Romans 12.1. If it had to be a phrase, it would be faith gives fitness a higher purpose. Um, so including God in your journey makes you go kind of beyond the aesthetics of getting fit. There is nothing. When I tell you there's nothing wrong with going for fitness for an aesthetic, that's fine. But what I want the overarching purpose to be is because I'm being a good steward over my body, because this body is borrowed. And I'm going to have to give it back because how many of us would want a, something that we lent to somebody to come back in worse condition than what we than when we lent it to them? Um, in the natural, we wouldn't want that. So what? how much more does God want us to give our bodies back to him in better condition? Um, well, obviously, we know we age, um, but he wants to see us being good stewards uh, over our body. And then social media emphasizes only aesthetics <laughs> sometimes. I know there's a pocket that, that you know, are um, sort of coupling fitspiration, um, but it has to be purposeful. I believe that you, only by including God in your walk will you have that stick to itness and you have a drive that is unexplainable um, that will get you out of bed in the morning. Uh, and, and, uh, for reasons other than just getting your heart rate up. Um, so our evidence, again, Paul says, I don't run aimlessly. I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm focused. I'm not distracted. I don't run aimlessly. I don't box as one beating the air. So you would look at somebody, what are you doing? You're spinning your wheels here. Um, you don't really know the purpose of what you're doing if you're just kind of boxing the air. But I discipline my body and I keep it under control for fear that after preaching to others, that I might be disqualified. And let me tell you, as a personal trainer, I have rehearsed this verse to myself 1,000 times because it's, you know, being the teaching <laughs> other people, uh, you become more susceptible yourself to being disqualified or falling, uh, you know, into the trappings. Number three, fitness to carry out God's calling. So I'm going to back up and tell every single one of you, you've got a calling. So let's get that out of the way. You've got a calling on your life. Um, everyone has been uh, given a measure of genius, a measure of uniqueness about them that only you can carry out in this world. There's, there's, it has your biomedical fingerprint on it. And if you don't do it, it doesn't get done. 
that's God's calling on your life. So you become better fit to carry out God's calling on your life with functional fitness uh, that you get by working out. So uh, the enemy would like nothing more than to make you feel like, I, you know, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what my purpose is. I, you know, I'm kind of, I, I just, nothing really turns me on. Uh, he wants you to wander aimlessly in life. Remember, Paul said, I'm not aimless. Uh, he wants you to be distracted. And, you know, I have no idea why you were created wasting time. But if you don't recognize this as a ploy, uh, you, you may never feel like you have a calling or or purpose on your life. Um, and you can't, you know, you can't draw away uh, out of what God has called you to do. Um, so I would encourage you to sort of look inward to, to recognize your calling because it is, it's there. First Peter, our, our evidence for this says, per, first Peter five, be sober-minded, be watchful because the enemy is, is prowling around. He compares him to a roaring lion. Have you ever seen a lion roar? <laughs> it's something to behold. A, roar, a roaring hungry lion is something different than a roaring full lion. So a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So we have to protect what God has called us to do, be, lest we fall to pray to uh, a roaring lion. Four, God grants strength in your fitness journey. And I can be a direct witness to this. Okay, so fitness is hard. <laughs> Let's just, I'm going to give you some practical steps later on. Um, but fitness is tough. Uh, and so you need the Holy Spirit's strength when yours is weak. Okay, because it will get weak. It will get weak. I don't care how passionate you are about fitness. Um, but 2 Corinthians says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is perfect when yours is weak. Um, so he actually tells us to brag about how weak you are. Don't stay there, but brag about it. Because when you brag about your weakness, his weakness is made perfect. His weakness is made, uh, I'm sorry, his strength is made perfect and his strength is um, made strong. Okay. Uh, so I retrofitted Romans 837 to be one of my fitness verses that I've given my clients because I love the Lord. I have conquered and taken control of anything in this workout that would overwhelm me and make me think I can't do it. Um, and so these are things that I have, uh, I've done prior to working out with clients. So we'll recite some affirmations later on um, in the talk. I can do all things. Philippians 4.13, I can do anything with him that strengthens me. Lastly, or second to last, Fitness is a way to witness to others, or you can say inspire others. So incorporating him into your journey um, is a way for you to inspire others and tell him, uh, tell them about God's mercy on your life. And, and, you know, you can give them impetus to get up and, and get moving. Um, it's a witness of the vigor that not only working out gives you, um, but also of the refreshing breath of life or what we call Zoe life from the Lord. And so we've got some uh, scriptures here uh, that tells us, tells us so. The last uh, number six role that faith plays in your fitness journey uh, before we move on to some affirmations uh, and some other tools and tips that you can use is disease prevention, discernment, and uh, discipline. So God hasn't called us to life, but he's called us to abundant life. He hasn't just called us here to breathe, um, for your heart to just pump. Um, he's called us to abundant life. Uh, according to John 10, 10, he's called us to abundant life. And I'm going to go through these a little bit more quickly because <laughs> I want to be mindful and I want to chat with you all. Um, third John 1 and 2, uh, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be good in health as you are well with your soul. So this gives us further evidence that uh, even prayers and supplications of, um, the, of the apostles were about not only your spirit, but also your health as well. Um, and then discipline, fit, you know, it's, it calls for discipline. It's tough. I won't sell you something that I, I don't have anything to sell you that says that, hey, 
this is not going to be hard. Um, Sometimes it, it will discipline and train you until you welcome the discipline. So that's the paradox that it doesn't get easy until you welcome the hard. Uh, and, I, and I can say that from a per point of view of a trainer, but I can also say that from a point of view of a competitor, that I know how it feels um, to end someone who has been away from the gym for a while, kind of fell off, and you come back and you're like, oh gosh, I'm back at day one. <laughs> um, so you have to develop that discipline again, but it, it, it does get easier. Um, and so we've got some uh, first Corinthians and I'll just highlight here. Uh, I discipline my body. I keep it under control uh, for fear that preaching to others that I may be disqualified. Lastly, discernment. Uh, so being healthy and fit has far reaching tentacles. Um, it, it, so don't underestimate it. Uh, it gives you, it keeps you more in tune with uh, the Holy Spirit or how, whatever you want to call it, your mother wit, your unctions, your gut feeling, um, because you're actively exercising control and discipline over your impulses. And that can't help but to have um, implications in other areas of your life. Uh, and so here's our Romans 12 and 2 uh, is, our, is our evidence for that. So the first step is uh, that I mentioned before is to forgive yourself. Uh, so I've heard it. Uh, that's what I was saying before I got disconnected. Um, almost nine years of training. I've heard so many people uh, berate themselves. Uh, overeating gets the best of me. I'm ashamed that I haven't been to the gym in years. I never really can maintain a program. I'm not where I once was physically. Um, but Romans 8, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you right there if that's something that you've rehearsed in your head. Romans 8 tells us if I love the Lord, which I'm sure you all do, uh, then I'm not condemned. In other words, he won't look at me with disapproving eyes for anything because my love for him will cause me to repent and turn my face from, and you can fill in the blank. Um, you can say overeating. You can say, you know, I've just slothfulness or, or whatever it is that you're struggling with. For some of you, you can't do this in your own strength. Uh, you've tried and it, you just kind of fall off. You try and you fall off. Um, but 2 Corinthians 12 tells us that, um, just like I said before, brag about your weakness uh, because that actually highlights his strength. And then talk to your faith and fitness trainer if that's something that they offer. I would offer my services, but um, but I am uh, I'd have to quit my job <laughs> um, to do it uh, again. Um, but I may come out of retirement. Um, but talk to your faith and fitness trainer about the shame um, and how uh, if you can get those necessary uh, steps and scriptures to experience God's forgiveness uh, throughout your fitness journey. And you can let go of shame today. And I'll say that again, you can let go of shame today. And if you are experiencing shame, you can let go of shame today, whatever it's tied to. Okay. Um, okay, so set your workout intention. So this is one of the most important um, the most important practical steps that I have is to set your workout intention. Uh, and I cannot express this enough how important this is uh, to declare your intention and declare your why. And it has to be written down. Yes. <laughs> um, for some, I've had as clients, I've had, oh, I just want to work out in my initial interview with them. I just want to work out to be healthy. And that might be too abstract for people of a reason for some people. It's not a real specific enough why. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, you need a more specific why. This workout is for me to be able to play with my granddaughter or my daughter for that matter. I want to take that hiking trip with my girlfriends. Um, I want to be able to, and I've, I've encouraged this. I'm not even kidding. I want to be able to comfortably zip my pants up without squirming into them. Um, that is a very, when I say that's a real goal that I've written down as the goal that we're after, it's a very real and tangible and legitimate goal. Improve my love life with my husband or my wife, uh, if there's some gents on here. <laughs> um, so these are the, 
the, the specific whys that I would encourage you to write down in your fitness journal that you will get for the 2022 year. Uh, and I'm only saying the year uh, because uh, not to say that you have to start in January, but because we're we're at the dawn of January. Um, so that's the only reason why I'm saying that. But I, so for your journals, uh, you've got to you've got to write these down, set your intentions. And I'm telling you, they are proven uh, for your success. Yes, it matters that you write it and you have to write it. <laughs> Work, you write your workout moves, uh, your reps, your sets and your weight. They don't have to be complicated. Um, but I want you to get into the habit of setting your intention before you get to the gym so that you're not aimless. Remember, you're not distracted. You're not, uh, you don't waste time at the gym. You're very set. You're very focused. Um, in the same way you, you know, you achieve your goals at work. Uh, you don't kind of go to work and say, oh, you know, we'll just see what we get done today. Uh, that's not a very viable uh, system to have. So as important as the biggest takeaway that I want you to have, as important as forgiving yourself, setting your workout intention, I want you to have your pre and post workout affirmations. This was a requirement of my clients. Uh, you had to state your affirmations and you had to state them uh, multiple times. Uh, throughout the workout. <laughs> For example, this workout is non-negotiable. Um, I have enough energy and fuel to get through this workout and crush it. I have enough strength and endurance to get through this workout. And I can, if you want, I can send these out to all, anyone who wants them. Um, this workout will feed my mind, my body, and my soul. Uh, my health will be increased and expand with every move. Can you imagine how powerful this is to say this before you start? I will begin to see weight loss, muscle gain, and muscle definition from this workout. Do, when I can't, I can't stress how, how powerful words are. And it's not, the, it's just proven. <laughs> just believe me. Um, and lastly, Lord, I offer this workout as a sacrifice. Based on your word, I offer it as a sacrifice and a seed of praise. And I ask that you would multiply my health, my wellness, and my fitness 100-fold as it is written in Genesis 26, 12. So um, that's just an example of some of the workouts. Uh, I'm sorry, some of the affirmations that I have given my clients to do. Um, and they have told me a thousand times over how much this actually aids them in their endurance throughout the workout. More pre and post. God has made me. You can say this before or after for your next workout. He's made my body strong and my mind strong enough to lift these weights. I will have an intense workout. Uh, I may not feel like it, but this is a sacrifice of praise and you will multiply it according to your promises. It will multiply my health, wealth, peace, and, over, and overall well-being. He's equipped me with more than enough cardiovascular endurance to get through this workout. I would encourage you to say this every single time you put on your tennis shoes and you get on the treadmill. God has equipped me with more than enough cardiovascular endurance to get through this workout. I will see the manifestations of my fitness goals begin today. You are calling things into existence, which is a biblical uh, power that you've been given actually to speak things that be not as though they were. I will enjoy all of the clinical, functional, social, mental, and spiritual benefits as a result of this workout. Amen. Of course, you have to say, and so be it, to seal, uh, to seal your belief in each of those. Okay, so even though those are affirmations, affirmations are actually different than prayers. Uh, your pre, and I know this, you're like prayers, <laughs> praying before a workout. They're really, really short. They're one-liners, but let me tell you how powerful a one-liner is. Um, so, uh, and I won't read, I'll, I'll try to read these quickly. I know you can eliminate shame and grant me self-efficacy. Lord, I know this new fitness journey in 2022 is good for me. So quick in my desire to get moving this year, I know it will please you. Leverage my physical offering, multiply it according to your word, and may it make you smile and be pleased with me. 
Um, and so there's others that, you know, help me to get through this next 30 to 45 minutes, as I know you can. Um, you know, thank you for my health and desire to be healthy. Uh, and then, uh, Lord, bless this workout, multiply it, let it be sweet, a sweet sight in your eyes. And I'm healed from all past trauma and nothing can interfere with God's desire to bless this workout. And lastly, uh, I can always begin my fitness journey again with you, Lord. Now, this is an, a, an important one. <laughs> I can always begin again. I carry no condemnation or shame. Thank you for granting me grace to be a good steward over my body. And thank you, Lord, for being pleased with my effort. Amen. So hopefully you are praying along with me because you know, hey, you can go to the gym after this. <laughs> you have all the equipment you need to go to the gym after this. Uh, or even, you know, downstairs to your home gym. There are other things you can do. I wish I had more time to talk about how to construct a faith and fitness vision board. Um, but to go beyond the vision board, which I think is important to have an accomplished board, uh, because Habakkuk tells us to write the vision make it plain before you that you'll run with it and you won't faint, you won't get weary. Um, so it, it's very important to, to say it and also put it before your eyes. Uh, get a fitness track. Again, I wish I had time to, to go through how to construct your fitness tracking journal um, with a scripture slash devotion of the day. Very simple, um, but, but very pivotal in your journey. And then what's coming is I am working on a 365 day uh, daily devotional prayers and affirmations book for women who are beginning their, uh, or who actually may even already be in the process of their fitness journey. So that's coming. <laughs> um, I'm hoping to do that within the next year. Okay, I'm rounding up here. Last uh, but not least, what are the benefits of, of this whole thing to, have sustainability and stick to itness. It inspires others to work out. It strengthens and deepens your relationship with God, which in turn, I promise you will give you meaning to your life. Uh, it ensures good stewardship over your body. Uh, it carries over, as I said, into other areas of your life. Uh, it will give you peace in turbulent times. Uh, and I know this sounds like a stretch, but I'm telling you, uh, it, it has a far reaching implications. It will allow you to respond rather than reacting. Uh, you can see past difficult trials and encourage yourself. And then your self-efficacy, I, I promise you, I guarantee uh, it will increase in other areas of your life. Um, and then lastly is you, it allows you to push past that fourth wall. When you think you have nothing left, uh, you can push past that fourth wall with the help of the Lord. Thank you.